dare to look into a world where you are vulnerable. Smile while the clueless glass shows what it sees, never knowing the beauty that lies beneath. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Juna, and I work to understand the universe. But most importantly, I'm the mom to Levi in the fifth grade. Shout out Miss Carney's class. <laughs> and Alex in the third grade. Shout out to Miss Green's class. So today, uh, in these modern times, you're subject to a lot of fake stuff. So this talk is going to be about what's real and specifically that space and time are real. And I'm also going to talk about how black holes are the entities that have revealed this very deep fact to us. So space, what is space and time? People have been arguing about this for many, many millennia. Now, Dali made this painting in 1931 to systematize confusion and to discredit completely reality. But actually, Dali captured elements of root reality here very, very well. You just need to appreciate general relativity and appreciate that space and time are dynamic to understand how good a job he did capturing reality. Now, what's space? You might think about space as something we're in, like this room, or something you put things in, like your locker. And what's time? Time seems to have this relentless and constant march forward, continuously, steadily beating onward. But these ideas about space and time, these are fundamentally local ideas. These notions are notions that are based on our intuition about our world and how we probe the world intuitively via our senses. This intuition is acquired when we're babies, as we learn to navigate the world, and see things, and understand how objects move in the world. But the development of mathematics and the recognition of its deep connection to nature allow us to go beyond these intuitive and limited senses. Now, we use our mathematical understanding of optics to augment our eyes by building telescopes. Now, these telescopes enable, to see, enable us to see further and deeper, and even at different frequencies than we can with our natural eyes. Now, Galileo didn't invent the telescope, but he did build one. And most importantly, he pointed it at the sky and wrote down what he saw in a publication called Starry Messenger. There, he reported on stars that nobody could see prior to that time. He revealed a hidden world to the people around him. And that was so exciting because people had a new way to probe this world. And that's what people like Kepler and ultimately Newton did try to understand the motions of the planets around the sun, for example, by this new technology. Now, Newton described how gravity worked in this book in 1687. And 100 years later, Kant rejected it in his book. Kant argued, as many people are arguing today, that there was no space or time. These were just our perce perceptions a manifold of appearances through which we understood the world. And Kant was right that Newton's theory was not perfect, but he was not right about what was wrong with it. In fact, Newton's laws could not explain the orbit of Mercury, and that actually bothered people for hundreds of years. Now, around the same time, you've got Kant telling people there's no reality, physics is wrong, you also have some very curious people digging deeper into the mathematics of gravity. See, after Galileo, people wanted to build bigger and bigger telescopes and see further and further things they couldn't see before. And what they found 
were more and more fascinating objects, including stars that orbited around one another the same way the planets orbited around our sun. And you have people like Mitchell and Laplace digging deeper into this mathematical theory to understand what it was about. Now, both of these individuals independently took Newton's theories to its natural edge mathematically. They start considering that there may be bodies who are so massive that even light can't escape their gravitational pull. And what's fascinating about that is that these ideas about black holes enter our human consciousness not through our intuition. No one was touching black holes, but through our reasoning, through our understanding. Because at the edge of gravity and at the edge of reality are black holes. And it turns out that people had been seeing these objects. They didn't know what they were yet, and it would take another few hundred years to figure that out. Now, Mitchell and Laplace had great ideas, but actually people kept struggling with gravity and continue to struggle with gravity. As I said, there are some problems with Newton's ideas. And people wanted to figure out, why doesn't Mercury work? So they struggled with that, always. We make some steps forward in this struggle. Then sometimes we get stuck, we have to keep struggling. And the key is not to give up. Anyway, it took another 100 years for people to realize that if they treated space and time together, dynamically, that they could solve that problem with Mercury. And they could solve many of the other gravity problems that they were struggling with. And this was general relativity, which has many important consequences. But two major ones have to do with black holes. First, the very first solution to Einstein's field equations is the black hole solution. So we know they exist in general relativity. And second, any orbiting body emits gravitational radiation. And because of black holes being so massive and so dense, when they orbit one another, they emit a lot of this gravitational radiation. Now, the black hole solution is a singularity in space-time. So black holes are called holes because they look like funnels, shown here. And they're black because they're, they, they perfectly absorb light at their event horizon. And this is an analogy to thermodynamics, because a black body in thermodynamics perfectly absorbs light. But the most interesting thing about black holes is that they have no surface. And that is why this picture is so important. Now, it doesn't look like much, but it's the first time that we've been able to view close to the event horizon of a black hole and see there's no surface. And that's spectacular fact. What does it even mean to have no surface? Think about that. Think about the chair that you're sitting in or the floor that your feet are resting on. Everything you've ever encountered has had a surface. So what does it mean to be an object without a surface? What does it mean about the way we understand the world we live in and how our sensory input affects our intuitions about the world? How do we go beyond these limitations to make important discoveries about the way reality truly is? How do you probe something without a surface? Are these just mathematical curiosities? But the most remarkable thing about black holes is that they aren't. We can actually measure them. But we have to go back to the math. This is a simulation of two black holes rotating around one another and ultimately merging to form a final black hole. This is a calculation that's done on large supercomputers. And what you see here in color is the way time is moving. The green shows time moving at its normal rate, and the orange and the red show time slowing down. And the purple shows the gravitational radiation that's being emitted as these two black holes, these two funnels in space-time, 
orbit around one another. So what's amazing here is that through general relativity, we can actually calculate what black holes look like when they orbit around one another and what signal they give off. At the bottom of this movie, I'm showing a calculation of the waves that are given off by this event in space-time. And now this is just a calculation, but actually we can measure this. And that's what happened in 2015. Using special telescopes, telescopes not designed to see light, but to probe the vibrations of space-time itself, the LIGO collaboration detected those waves from two black holes orbiting and colliding. There are so many exciting things about these detections and about the many detections that they've made since. We have an entirely new way to probe our universe, just like in Galileo's times. The world is just opening up to us in this respect. Um, but I think the most important thing that we've learned is that space-time itself is real and it moves the way we expect it to move in general relativity. Now this tells us that Newton and Kant and Dali were all wrong, uh, and general relativity is probably not perfect either. Uh, gravity is strangely weak among the fundamental forces, and that fact bothers everybody who bothers to think about it. But space-time is real. And that's what this proves. And anyone who tells you different is either from the 1700s or doesn't appreciate black holes. Thank you.